Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody out to our lesson in First Thessalonians. <clears throat> We've been uh, spent the last week or two on the introduction to set the context, and now we're starting to go verse by verse. And we uh, left off last week with the with looking at the salutation or the greeting of the writer of the book or the epistle uh, to the church in Thessalonica. And so we're going to continue just to go right through that, and we'll just move right on through the book that way. Um, uh, before we get into that this morning, that part of that this morning, I'd like us to take a moment of time and go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll get right at it. Gracious Holy Father, we come before you, Lord, thankful for this day, for the blessing of it, for the life that you've bestowed upon us, for your care for us, for your abundant mercy and grace, Lord, for the peace that you give. We thank you for your help and, and matters of life that we deal with and the struggles that we face. And we thank you for uh, caring for us, Lord, the way you do, um, even though we're unworthy of such care. We pray, Father, that you'll forgive us of our sins and failures. We ask that you'll bless this lesson. I pray, Lord God, that you'll you'll take full control of the lesson, that your spirit might lead out, um, that your will might be accomplished, that the word might be productive, and that it will not return unto you void. I pray, Father, that you will receive the honor and glory in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you'll save souls today. I pray that you'll change lives, that you'll build us up, help us to mature, to grow, and to um, prosper in the understanding of your truth and to apply it to our lives. Father, we pray that you'll um, bless this church and her work here, that you'll remember our many requests for prayer throughout this past week. You'll bless them according to your will. Father, we ask that you'll just go with us now and we ask um, your blessings in this effort. And Lord, we ask these favors and blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so um, let me get this slide going here. <laughs> I got some some pictures that um, that I, I put in here that I found myself, as you'll see some of them as we go through it, they were, they were affecting me while I was studying. I got emotional. I was getting emotional by, by this outline because of the content. Like this picture, for example, says, only God's grace could reach so low and lift so high. And when you start to get into the, the thought of the, what, some of the things we're going to cover, it, it, it just affected me. I found my, my eyes wanting to well up, um, remembering my sin and the price he paid for it. And the greater, the greater thing that I was remembering is the price he paid. Um, it's, it's hard when you hear a message uh, that a preacher may bring from time to time where he talks about, you know, all the different things Christ suffered. And, and when a, a, a minister does a lot of research um, from a historical standpoint, understand when the Romans did something, they did it better than anybody. When it came when it came to tor torture, that was certainly true. And and imagining that the life force of God was incapable of being taken. So here he's in a human form. We had just bleed out, but it was not possible for Jesus to die. It was it was his choice to give up his life. So when he's going through the scourgings and things that he's suffering, it we would have been dead probably through the scourging process, not Jesus. And so you think about him feeling everything he felt and the cat of nine tails on his back, cutting into his flesh and things along that line. But death was, it was, it wasn't time because there was a lot of sin to pay for <clears throat> and mine were among them. And so we'll get into those, some of those thoughts as we get into this, uh, this lesson today. So the first thing, the balance of the salutation is the confident hope and prayer of Paul for the brethren. One thing you'll, you'll learn about Paul is that he was always, he was a, he was a good under-shepherd in that he was always caring and worried, and, and when I say worried, at, at, concerned after the welfare of the people, and he wanted nothing more than to see them succeed. So it's fitting to, to as an example for us to be likewise. We should always be this kind of people. Now, I understand that that as a pastor, you might feel it more um, because of your, your responsibilities as a pastor and the under-shepherd of one of the Lord's churches. But that shouldn't stop God's people and the brethren from feeling that way. 
and wanting to see the best and the welfare of others. Um, he says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is one of the most wonderful words in all language, expressing the idea of one receiving what he does not deserve. So getting that which you don't deserve, that's gracious. <laughs> Whoever provided that which you do not deserve was being gracious towards you. Now in the Greek, the word is charis, and it means graciousness. It comes from a root word that means graciousness as gratifying. So it, it has a, a positive lift to it. Um, and not only for the giver, but for the receiver. So graciousness as gratifying of manner or act, especially in the divine influence on the heart. So the, the word is describing um, a greater impact when, it's, when the graciousness is, is affecting the heart and is being influenced by God. So God's divine influence. So when uh, you're a person that's lost and you come to that reality that you need Jesus as your savior and you experience that uh, salvation by grace through faith, then you, uh, you will understand completely holy at that moment how, how this word grace can mean so much. It's elevated in that moment because of the fact that you just received God's grace and the impact that that had on your heart is probably going to be a lot stronger and a lot more powerful than if I do something for you that's a helpful to you. You might feel, you might feel um, blessed if I do something, but when God's moving and when God's activating um, change by his grace, then it has a greater value and it's felt more deeply. And that's exactly how I felt when I was saved. I, I felt, I felt, I've told the story, but I'm, I'm not going to do that again this time, maybe next week. <laughs> but, but I felt like grateful. I felt grateful. I felt so happy that I wanted to tell people that what God had done, and that was the impact that he had on my heart. Paul wrote the beautiful words stating how the believers of all ages have been saved. We have used these passive scriptures. You should have them memorized by now because we've used them so many times, but I'm going to slow it down for you because I want us to really just think about what's being said to this Ephesian church. Um, and I want you to just put it into context uh, in your mind. And, and sometimes just slowing down when you're reading the Bible will give you the opportunity to just meditate on what is being said there. So let's look at it. It's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And honestly, that whole chapter, that chapter is fantastic. Um, but the whole book's fantastic. I, I like Ephesians. But it says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I didn't sound like I slowed it down for you, but we're going to do that now. <laughs> For by grace, so it's by grace, you're saved. By grace are you saved, okay? And it's through the channel or avenue of faith. So, faith has to be an element that is present with regard to the saving grace of God, which means basically that the individual had to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God the Son, all man, all flesh, but all God, and that he lived a sinless life, willfully submitted to the death of the cross, was placed in the grave, and on the third day rose from the grave because the power of death had no authority over him. He was not subject to it because there was no trespass. There was no, nothing he had to pay for. The death he paid was for us, and the, ra the raising he rose was for us as well, but it was an, it was an, an automatic um, for him because of his deity. Um, but if you think about it, you got to have that faith. You got to believe, right? 
And then he says, this salvation or this gift is that it's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. And I'm going to put those together here because it's not of yourselves, not of works. It's a gift of God because we understand one, there's not a work we could do that is going to satisfy the government of God. We may satisfy the government of man. You could possibly do something that would satisfy my judgment. But what is my judgment? It's about as valuable as the dollar is these days, <laughs> you know? Okay. I should have used something else, but uh, that's to say not very. It's paper, right? And so, but... <clears throat> If 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 I if my judgment was satisfied, I may say, well, you go free. But you would still have to answer to the government of God. And that's you're not going to find satisfaction there because of the trespass of sin. So and if we could do something, if there was let's just say hypothetically that there was a thing we could do. And we did it, then God would owe us salvation which would effectively be making him a debtor. <laughs> and we know God's no debtor. That's why it's called the gift of God, because we understand that those things are not possible. We can't work for our salvation. And that's why baptism doesn't save, because that's a work. Okay, that's why knocking on a million doors, telling people about this or that, and trying to get right with God. If you're not right with God, is still going to result in you facing the judgment of God. And it's a good thing that it's a gift because it takes away the boasting of men. I did this. I accomplished this. I overcame. Because that's what we love to do. <laughs> we love to boast. There's no doubt, man. Woo-wee. Those award shows, regardless of whether it's TV award shows or how many things they got anyways. Too many? I mean, every time I, t it's, it's this award show season. I mean, there's like, there's like 50 of them or something, you know, <clears throat> they like to, they like the honor to themselves. They'd like to honor themselves. We like to boast about our accomplishments. We like to boast about uh, the things we've done, but this is not something we can boast about because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ paid the price for our sin so that we might live and have a relationship with God. And, and I, I specifically say a relationship with God because that's going to come paramount to something else later in the lesson. So the purpose of salvation is so that we can have a relationship with God. And that having a relationship with God is productive and it's beneficial for our lives. Really, um, that's where we're going to find our greatest success. Okay, here he spoke of the only way for the lost to be saved. They needed to come to God asking for that which they could never earn or deserve and trust God to give them saving grace. And on the promise of his word, he will do just that. That's a guarantee. The word guarantees that he will give, he will save those who call upon his name. However, these church members in Thessalonica were already saved and had already received saving grace. Good. But there's something to point out. Because here Paul is saying, you know, grace be unto you. So yet there's more grace available for believers who will commit to serving the Lord as these have chosen to do. So the point is this. Grace doesn't just stop at salvation. It's available all the time. In fact, I don't want to jump ahead, but I'm probably going to do it a little bit. We really need God's grace, okay? But the point is, is it's always available for us as children of God, as those who've, who've uh, put our faith and trust in him, you know? And, and really, as we commit to serve, there's even a more abundance of grace available because it's necessary for our success in service and commitment in worshiping and serving him. The writer of Hebrews, while writing the Jewish Christians uh, whose commitment was dwindling, penned the following words. Now I'm going to put up a picture right after I click this button, and this picture got me. Um, and I, I had not seen it before, it just, it, but it did get me. Uh, and and I'll let I'm going to stop right there and 
somebody know that the back door kind of got blown open there? Um, Kenny, maybe you can check it out. Sorry, we're having wet, bad weather right now. <laughs> I don't want it to rip the door off the hinges. Um, anyways, so the writer of the book of Hebrews, while writing the Jewish Christians whose com uh, commitment was dwindling, penned the following words. And here's that picture. This picture got me because what I wanted to, to look up when I found this was God's amazing grace. And this is what came up. And it, and it, it welled up my eyes, and it still kind of chokes me up a little bit. We were sinners, yet Christ died for us, and all that entails. And and if you were to if you were to go study, um, the Gospels, you would see. And I I don't I don't think that the writers really could convey the magnitude of the suffering of Jesus Christ. I mean, you would really have to do a, even some deeper research his, from a historical standpoint. What it meant to be basically crucified by the Romans and understand what they did and how they did it, and how brutal they were in doing it. Um, and so his death even had an impact on a guard, you know, at, at that was standing by why he was crucified. And so it, it the, the sacrifice was great, but look, look what he says, because this is a victory. We see the suffering of Jesus Christ, and it hurts, and it should hurt, and it should cause us to feel the sorrow and the burn. But, <laughs> but it was really a victory. I love that. I love the book of Hebrews. I've said that it's it's a very powerful book, and this is why. Here's a little excerpt of it. Hebrews chapter four, verses fourteen through sixteen says, "Seeing then that we have a great high priest." that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So what has happened here is this great victory that Jesus won for us, He's opened up the door for us to literally approach the throne of grace. And hopefully when you pray, you imagine that that's where you're at in your mind. You put yourself there because that's where you're at. And, and, and this great mediator between God and man is there mediating on our behalf. But it says, let us therefore come boldly. He's, he's, this is a call out. Come boldly into the throne of grace. Look, you know we all know we're sinners. <clears throat> and, and I've heard the pastor say it, I've said it, and I've heard many of you say it, that sometimes you feel like you're always repenting for the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find that mercy and the grace to help in time of need. And so that is an invitation for us and, and a promise, really, because the grace of God really has no end capacity. Um, it, it, it is a, a spring that wells up continually. God's children need the unmerited favor of God every day of their lives. And he invites his children to come boldly to his throne of grace to receive that which is needed daily. Grace is the gift of God. <clears throat> Is a is is the a gift of God, grace is a gift of God is always willing to give God is always willing to give to his children. I know I was just getting that on my brain wrong. Grace is a gift of God that God is always willing to give to his children. I'm missing a word. Um, nevertheless, I'll submit that he does not so he does so daily, even when we are not actively asking for it. My personal opinion is why we should be seeking the grace of God daily. God's being gracious to me even when I'm not asking for it. Um, he was gracious to me the minute I woke up and realized that I was still alive today. Um, he was great. He's been gracious to me in so many different ways of providing needs that I've had throughout the week. Um, Jesse was talking about a pretty heavy week he had. I was thinking, I, guy, I couldn't have got any worse. Well, I could, probably could have, but <laughs> you just having a rough one there. But there was a lot of grace. I'm sure you could you could say you experienced over the course of those trials. 
God moving and working and, and, and helping. Um, yet we also find that we can get God's grace by praying when we pray for it, for things that might be needed in, not only in our lives, but in the lives of others. I've watched God move in the lives of other people and, and, and pour out his grace upon them so that they can endure the difficult things. And so what we refer to grace as closing out the subject of grace is the unmerited favor of God is really what the word means. It's the unmerited favor of God and God is gracious. So that brings us to the next thing he, he wanted. He was praying for them and it had to do with peace. And it says, peace with God, Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so being justified by faith. Do you notice the, the word there in Romans, justified? That's the, the important thing about that. This is just not in the outline, just me thinking about it right now. But that's a powerful word that has been revealed there in that text. Justified. When a saved child of God stands before the judgment seat of Christ, <clears throat> What is seen is the justification of Christ upon them. Meaning that as I stand before God, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be judged for sin in my life, for the sin that condemned me to death. I will be free from that burden because I'm justified. I have now been justified through the blood of Jesus Christ by my faith. And so his his righteousness is now my righteousness in Christ Jesus. And that's not, a, that's not a, a, a free pass to sin. God forbid. The scriptures even say, where, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. No, that's not. And, and, and a child of God doesn't want to stay in that pattern. And really the spirit will, will, will move them to not stay in that pattern. You won't see it happening. It's all going on inside. Oh, don't think <laughs> that just because a person's acting all normal and stuff, they ain't fighting an, an internal battle with themselves with regards to sin in their life. And that's the war of the two natures that's talked about in the book of Romans, chapter 7. So, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Initially, you get this peace of God that I talked about earlier when, when you realize you've been freed from your sin burden and, and your sin payment. But there's also a peace that comes from God by being in relationship with God. And that was the whole purpose of salvation is to be in a relationship with God and being in a relationship with God brings peace. So the next thing that Paul wished for these believers to have was peace. Peace is this, that sense of tranquility that is not dependent on circumstances. So even in all the trials that Jesse was experiencing this week, there could be times, whether he experienced them or not, there could be times where he could still have a sense of tranquility, even in light of the difficulties, because the sense of peace is not dependent on the circumstances that he was facing. He, he could probably say to himself in a lot of those situations, I know God's in control and I trust him or even go to him in prayer and find comfort um, with dealing with those things like we all do uh, from time to time when we have those challenges in life. The night before he was crucified, Jesus taught his disciples on their way from the upper room to the garden of Gethsemane. And this is what he said. During during that trying time for Jesus and the apostles, he spoke these wonderful words of encouragement when he, he said, peace, I leave you. Peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So if you don't realize what he's saying here, he's actually giving them a kind of a last will and testament. He's saying, peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I, unto, give I unto you. So as a result of that, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. These, with these words, Jesus made a promise to his disciples that they would have peace. This is an inheritance specified by the last will and testament of Jesus. This is part of an inheritance that we have as a saved child of God, that we have Christ's peace 
that he will give us peace, that it can reside with us and we can experience it. The natural question is then, why do so many children of God not have peace? <laughs> well, there can only be really kind of one thing, and this is it. The answer seems to be in the absence of fellowship with the Lord. Remember, the whole purpose of salvation is to have a relationship with God so that we could have a relationship with God. Because before we're saved, we're alienated from God. We, we're not um, a child of God. We're alienated. We're essentially standing in a position of enemies of God because of this sin nature that we're guilty of. Not to mention the fact that, that God has already provided us freedom from that if we choose through his son, Jesus Christ. So we're standing in a position not only as enemies of God, but as rejectors of the gift of God in Christ Jesus. So the whole purpose is to win us back to where we can be in fellowship with God, have that sin completely removed. Because if it's not completely removed, we don't have a relationship with God. All Adam did was disobey, right? One. He had one thing. One. One thing. So there can't be just one last sin that's unaccounted for. Jesus shed blood, paid the price for all sin. Now, I, you'll note I sin every day, but that's not the sin that I commit every day is relationship driven, meaning that it hinders my relationship. It doesn't stop me from being a child of God. And the sin itself has already been paid for on the cross of Calvary, but it can affect my relationship with God. Sure. Just like our kids disobeying can affect our relationship with us. They don't stop being our children and we don't stop loving them and trying to care for them and trying to lead them into a better way. But uh, they'll always be my children, right? And we'll always be his. But the absence of fellowship with the Lord, is it'll create a situation where we're not experiencing the peace we should be experiencing because we're not actively having relationship with God which is really the intent of salvation is to have a relationship. So if we can have that relationship with God and we make effort to do so through all the ways that the scriptures teach us to do, to do just that, whether it be through studying, praying, you know, meditating on the word, trying to live by it, trying to apply it to our lives, trying to help others, trying to be good citizens and, and, and society, trying to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, all these different things then, you know, you're going to find that you're going to be more peaceful. You know, every time I take on a project, I think to myself, why did I do that? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm regretting the second big project I ever took on in my life, every day of my life right now. Um, and, and that's because I don't have the kind of peace I should have. And it hinders my peace. But... Um, here I find I, I'm settled in the house of the Lord. And I love this. Why I love coming to the house of the Lord because I find peace here and it settles my spirit and calms me. Um, and praying does, does a great job of that as well. So if we're absent in fellowship, we're going to, we're going to find that our peace will wane. Uh, Paul wanted these committed Christians to have the peace that only Christ can give. So, that moves us into another subject, and you see this person praying. I liked the picture for obvious reasons. Um, it seemed very heartfelt, and it touched me that way. We're going to talk about intercessory prayer in verses 2 and 3. And I found myself wondering when I read these verses, if we prayed like this, like the Apostle Paul prayed, how our churches would be today? How would our, what, what, what would they look like? What would the landscape look like? in our society if we prayed the way Paul prayed. So here's those verses. First Thessalonians 1, 2 through 3 says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So we give thanks And notice he says, to God always and for you all. So they're, he, they're thanking God always for them, meaning being there and, and being faithful, making mention of you in our prayers. That There's something that's being said here 
that you should see. One, he's speaking in the in the present tense, and two, the fact that he's saying making mention of you in our prayers is showing a repetitious pattern, which means it's it's a thought based motivated thing. They're on his mind, so he's making mention. You ever have someone ask you to pray about something? Do you do it? <laughs> if you don't do it, then that's not on your mind. Or if you're not doing it continually, then it's not on your mind. The whole part of the the lessons we've been learning on Wednesday night is to set a pattern of prayer for for a work you're involved in, right? And that pattern of prayer should be consistent. And so when we're asked to pray for people, whether it's people that's that we're praying within our, our own circles or that we've been asked to pray for, if we're thinking about them and it's on our mind and it's on our heart, we're going to pray and we're going to be doing it consistently. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and the Father. Now, there's a little history we need to go to, and that's why I brought this little picture up. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your abundant blessings. This, is, this, this picture expresses how the Apostle Paul must have felt. Because if, if you remember, when we start talking about the introduction, we said that Paul didn't get to spend a lot of time in Thessalonica because he got ran out, essentially. He was, he was forced to leave under duress. Um, and so a lot of this writing that he's going to write is going to kind of help shore up some of the things he didn't get a chance to really establish there doctrinally. Um, which, you know, it'd be great if he could stay there as long as he, he stayed in, let's say, like Corinth, you know, but he just didn't have the opportunity. So uh, an epistle like this would go a long ways in helping them fortify their doctrinal understanding, which is really what we want to do. Uh, it'll help our peace to, to be fortified. So Paul was very thankful for the incredible tenacity demonstrated by these brethren. And when I say brethren, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of all the people of the church, brothers and sisters in Christ there. No doubt, as Paul waited in Berea, Athens, and Corinth, he had many restless moments as he contemplated how these brethren were doing. I mean, he didn't have word at that point, right? Timothy is the one that initially brought word. After all, Paul had, been un, had, had left under duress, but these brethren still lived in the surroundings where the Jews were still angry and stirred up the people against the followers of Jesus Christ. He was wondering about their welfare. How were they? were they? Were they faring well? Were they being attacked? Were they being hauled off into prison? Were they being persecuted for the cause of Christ? And how were they holding up? Therefore, when he heard of their steadfastness, he rejoiced. And that, that's what you can hear it in the language of, his, of what, you, what we read in verses 2 and 3. You can hear it. His, his, his rejoicing, his thankfulness. And that's how he starts. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And as I mentioned, the use of the present tense gives continuing force to the words, a continuing force. We give thanks to God always for you. He, he, it's, an, it's an expression of gratitude, not only to them for allowing the Lord to use them, but for God, for being faithful to bestow the grace upon them to endure and the peace of God to endure. And so he was, he was grateful that they were faring well. One can feel both the apprehension and relief Paul sensed when Timothy delivered the news concerning these brethren. Certainly, and we're running out of time here, we're going to start winding down. Certainly, Paul was relieved upon hearing of their well-being, both physically and spiritually, spiritually, when he said, making mention of you always in our prayers signifies that if he was in fact doing that, that he was well relieved when he heard that they were okay physically and spiritually. The intensity and, conti and continued nature of Paul's prayer would indicate that he had a degree of anxiety concerning their welfare and situation. Now, one might ask about the intense anxiety Paul felt, you know, and others and, prompt, and you know, you think, okay, well, he had all this anxiety. He had all this um, concern. Some might say, well, isn't that an expression of a lack of faith? 
if you really believe God had all things in control, would, why would you be so anxious? Where is the peace of God? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I brought this picture up <laughs> just because I liked it. God says, when you start to worry, stop to pray. <laughs> when you start to worry, stop to pray. Now, I put that in also because I liked it, but because what we're about to cover here. Jesus himself gave the ultimate example of the value of the purpose of repeating prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed the same prayer three times. Okay? Each time, he asked the Father if there was any other way, yet all three times the answer was the same. There's no other way. This got me. In his human body, Jesus knew exactly the intensity of agony and suffering awaiting him as he was about to suffer the full penalty of the sins of humanity. Think about that. He was all human. He knew, and, and he knew, he, he, he knew what he was going to suffer. What it was going to, he, he knew the pain he was going to suffer, the separation of the father he was going to suffer. When the father, when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He saw all that. He understood it. And he, it, it grieved him. He agonized. And so he prayed this prayer three times. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 38 and 39, it says, Indeed, Jesus said, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Can you feel it? Does that hit you? Does, do you feel the agony? Do you feel the grief? He fell on his face and prayed, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He knew the answer. The same, this same prayer of Jesus was uttered three times. And I will have you refer to the following verses. Matthew 26, verses 40 through 44. Will you see that? Clearly, it was not a lack of faith on part of Jesus. Rather, he prayed enough times until he was at peace about the matter. So there's a difference. He wasn't lacking faith. He was praying until he was at peace in the, with the matter. And there's a difference. The same was true for Paul then. He knew, he knew God was aware and that he had a beneficial and be, uh, benevolent plan for his brethren. Yet Paul worried and he prayed. And we'll close with this. We're a little early, but that's okay because I usually run over. Therefore, the believer must always remember that God knows all about their concerns, yet it honors God for his child to pray until they have peace about the matter. Repetitious praying about something is, is okay because we're seeking peace and God's will in it. And we don't always know what the will of God is. We know really, you know, I say we almost never know what the will of God is in certain situations we face um, until after. But we can pray and, and find peace that when we leave it there, you know, I'm praying for my wife that she comes through the surgery or that she's going to be okay with whatever treatment she's going through and that she's not going through surgery and having treatment, but I'm just using that as an example. And I keep on praying and praying and praying until I'm prayed to the point where I feel like I, I've given it over to God. And now whatever the outcome is, I will be in a better position to accept it because I know now that I finally come to a place where God's will is done. And here's the thing. In the end of the day, what I've come to learn in my experience is the thing that God does is always better, the better outcome. Like, it may, and I, I, I understand when I say that, that you could probably go through a whole bunch of things and say, well, was it a better outcome that this happened or that that happened? 
It depends. Sometimes I've seen I've seen seen people receive God's gift of salvation at the funeral of someone else who died. Okay? From God's standpoint, that was pretty beneficial, especially if the person who passed away was a saved child of God. Now, if we're in in relationship with God and we understand these things on a greater level, then when say it's my loved one, I would love nothing more. I would rejoice. And I, I say that in all fairness and truth. If someone was saved at the service of one of my loved one's funerals, that I, I couldn't think for a, a better way to celebrate the life of that person. Um, and I would rejoice over that. Um, because it's point unto man wants to die anyways. We all know that. So I know I'm dealing with some heavy stuff. But I want what I'm trying to do is put it into a different perspective to where when when we face these things, that we see that we're gonna have challenges in life and we're gonna have things that we have to deal with. But it's a matter of perspective. Are you a half cup half full or a half empty person? And so when we see that that God has always has all things under his control, that even some of the things we have to face that are distasteful or difficult. There's a value in it for us, and there, there, a good could come out of it. What, what good came out of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? He was tortured hard. This came out of it. Here we are today. God spared not his son. Are we greater than his son? No. He spared not his son, and what came out of it, what, what was a tragic moment in history, from all appearances, actually resulted in the saving grace and the kingdom of God, the eternal God being established. And so I'll use that example to make the point. We must always remember that God knows all about our concerns. It honors him when we pray about them. And God's, God's grace is sufficient. All right? We'll go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Loving Holy Father, we give you praise today for the truth of your word, for the sacrifice of your son, and the price that he paid for our sakes and for all that we benefit from today. We can't even imagine the things that he endured, and I'm not sure that that we could conceive them and have the capacity to conceive them on the level that he felt it and understood it. But we know that it resulted in an opportunity for us to be saved, to be forgiven, to be justified. And we give you praise for that because we know we're sinners and undone, Lord, that we have, we were just in a bad place. And we know that through Christ Jesus, we found restoration. We got hope. We got the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction, the promise of peace. We got so much. So we give you praise today and pray, Lord God, that you receive the honor and glory. We thank you. We love you. We ask, Father, that you'll move in these services, that you'll go with this word, and that it might accomplish your will and bring you honor and glory through Christ Jesus. I ask these favors and blessings in Christ's holy name. Amen. Thank you.